It's a great joy to be back with you again. My name is Jimmy Mitchell. I come from Tampa, Florida. I'm still getting used to saying that out loud. That feels kind of crazy. But regardless, I'm a Floridian like so many of you, and it's been a really amazing and powerful weekend. I've already talked to so many of you in the in-between moments, particularly about adoration last night, many of you who went to reconciliation, some of you who described a, a bit of a, a tingling sensation even in prayer at some point over these first 24 hours together, which is kind of a, a crazy thing to say. I mean, how often does that happen where you sort of experience something out of the ordinary, particularly in a spiritual encounter with God? Whether it's a tingly sensation, whether it's tears, or even just a deep and abiding peace that perhaps you've begun to feel this, feel this weekend, you can rest assured that those are good signs that the Holy Spirit is teaching you more and more how to pray. But before we dive into it, I just want to share a brief story. I've had the privilege over the last 10 years of leading pilgrimages to Rome, usually a couple times a year. But on average, once, at least once I'm in Rome. I've been over there 15 times, in fact, but one of the first times I ever went, I had the great joy of sitting front row, really in the, the front section, front row, for a papal audience with Benedict XVI. You can see here he's hopping in his Pope mobile. This was, I think, May of 2007. So he was a couple of years into his papacy, and I was a bit of a Benedict fan, to say the least. I read every encyclical he wrote. I've gone back and read many of his books. The way that Jason Everett feels about St. John Paul II is how I feel about Pope Benedict XVI. I wouldn't be the man that I am today if it wasn't for this guy. So you can imagine my joy as I'm sitting front row and he's coming by in his Pope mobile and his very cute little red hat that he was given that day. And I am sitting there with my friends, my three closest friends, inches away from the Holy Father. This was a pretty cool experience for somebody who was already a little bit obsessed with this guy. Like, I've only had a few idols down through the years, and I don't mean like idols as in Old Testament, fire and brimstone, crush them idols. I mean like people I look up to, heroes. Benedict has always been at the top of that list. So imagine me as a 19-year-old, 20-year-old, front row, the Holy Father getting closer and closer. In fact, maybe you can't quite see it yet, but my hand is just ever so slightly hovering over his. It's trembling. I'm so nervous at this point. But I'm also full of a great deal of joy and excitement. In fact, if you still can't quite see it, I'm just going to zoom in one more time. Yeah, that's my hand connecting with the Holy Father's hand. I don't actually have that picture, but it happened. My hand over his. I shared this story with a bunch of middle school boys last week, and they insisted on shaking my hand afterwards, just, just to touch the hand that touched that man's hand. Kind of weird, but kind of awesome. Pope Benedict XVI. See, what happened is a year later, he came to America. I, I don't know if any of you guys remember this. You would have been four, maybe three years old, five years old at best. He celebrated his birthday at the White House. I mean, I think that's a, a fairly unprecedented experience for a pope. And you can imagine they really brought out the, imagine, the best imaginable cake you've ever seen. And Benedict just looked very happy with his little beer and his cake. He, he's a German. He loves beer, right? And I think we took pretty good care of him while he was in America, but there was this one point where he was a part of a massive youth rally outside of New York at a, a seminary called Dunwoody. And it was kind of a cool experience. I mean, I was there about 12 hours before the Holy Father showed up with many of my closest friends because he wanted to get front row. Again, I had some experience with this. I didn't think I would touch him this time. I thought, let's at least get there early and get front row. And sure enough, they bring in every imaginable artist who's ever even pretended to be Catholic or maybe sung an Ave Maria Schubert style on a sacred music project. I mean, everybody from Matt Marr to Kelly Clarkson showed up that day for the pregame leading up to Pope Bennett XVI's arrival. But there came a point where you could sense the excitement in the air. If I'm not mistaken, he came in via helicopter. Tens of thousands of us cheering our heads off as the Holy Father arrives. There's things he said that day that I'll, I'll never forget. At one point he was attacking relativism. And he said, don't forget... Dear young people, the truth is not an opting out, 
but an opting in. There were other things he said that day that I'll never forget. One of them went like this. This was sort of the climax of his talk to these tens of thousands of young people scattered in this massive field outside of a seminary just north of New York City. He said, and I repeat in my best German accent, there is nothing more important than developing your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. <sighs> the crowd went wild. And really, up until that point, most of my friends were evangelical Christians, like really on fire Protestants, or they were atheists and agnostics. I didn't have very many Catholic friends. I wasn't quite taking Mari's advice yet of finding those good Catholic friends that I can storm heaven with together. I felt pretty isolated, not only in high school, but certainly in college. And suddenly, I was surrounded by tens of thousands of like-minded young Catholics who all got fired up with the simplest call, which was to make our relationships with Jesus Christ the centerpiece of our lives. Now, it's funny, I've shared that story many, many times, and I've shared that quote many times. And recently, I went back and I looked it up. And either they changed it, okay, in the Vatican website, or I've been misquoting it all along, but it actually went something like this. That what matters most is that you develop your personal relationship with God. And that relationship is expressed in prayer. With a German accent, of course, end quote. That pretty much sums up the Christian life. That we are made to be in deep, personal, intimate relationship with God himself. That what, what was once only Jesus's by nature that of being a beloved son of the Father, became ours by grace 2,000 years ago. A grace that he won on the cross, that he brought into the world through his glorious resurrection, his conquering of death and sin once and for all. One of my favorite saints is Jose Maria Escrivá, a great Spanish saint, the founder of Opus Dei. He once said that at any given moment, you should be ready to put your head up and your shoulders back. And to stand proud, not on your own accounts, not by your own merit, but to stand proud as a beloved son or daughter of God the Father. That this is actually what's revealed to us in our commitment to prayer, in our relationship with God, that he is in fact Abba Father. That we are his beloved sons and daughters. Imagine if everybody in the church walked around not confident in themselves, but confident in that relationship. They knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that they were beloved sons and daughters. Imagine how different the world would be. So I guess the question for many of us is, well, what is prayer and why does it really matter all that much? If developing this personal relationship with God is what our entire faith is about, and then that's primarily expressed through prayer, then how do we even go about it? Where do we even start? Who can give me just a definition of prayer? Probably somebody in the first few rows so I can hear you. But raise your hand and give me a very brief definition of prayer. What is it? What is prayer? Yes. Excellent. It's talking to God. Who wants to add to that? Not only is prayer talking to God, what else is it? Shout it out. Oh, beautiful. Having an open, and mind, open mind and heart, particularly in the presence of God. I love that. She's got a lot of fans over there. I like that. What would you add? What else is prayer? It's talking to God. It's being open to God. What else is it? Jake, yeah. Petitioning God. Listening to God. What else? A what? A promise. Okay. So there's a lot of different ways that we can pray. But one of my fa favorite definitions comes from Teresa of Avila, that prayer is nothing else than being on terms of friendship with God. Every time I see the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, particularly in my travels where I, I'm going from one city to the next all summer long, and then I suddenly end up in another place where Jesus is on the throne, you have no idea how at home I feel. One of the first things that I did yesterday after checking into the hotel was I got to go to Mass with, with Father Jonathan and several of the other speakers. And I just stayed in there and I prayed. And I, it was just like being with my best friend. Jesus really is my best friend. 
The, the best way that I know to cultivate my friendship with him is daily prayer, to commit the hard stuff of prayer. Not necessarily the, the emotions of prayer or the good feelings that we get even at a Superville conference, but the daily grind of showing up and allowing God to love me. That's the source of all of my joy. Friendship with the Lord. So what I'd love to do is propose to you something very, very simple. And before I even propose it, I want to just make sure we understand the two major kinds of prayer. Vocal prayer is what we did only half an hour ago. Mari led us in that beautiful decade of the rosary. Vocal prayer doesn't necessarily mean that it's being spoken or prayed out loud. It mostly means that this is a memorized prayer, almost like a devotion that we repeat over the course of a lifetime. Vocal prayer includes everything from the Our Father and the Hail Mary and the Glory Be to the, the full rosary, even all 20 mysteries, divine mercy chaplet, stations of the cross. These are all examples of prayers that we've inherited, right? We stand on the shoulders of some spiritual giants who have gone before us. So when I say vocal prayer, that can even be in our heads and in our hearts, prayers that we repeat that have been prayed for hundreds of years. Pretty great stuff. A lot of our great litanies are all part of this category of vocal prayer. But what we want to jump into right now is what the church calls mental prayer. It doesn't mean necessarily your intellect, although it absolutely includes your intellect. It mostly means your heart, praying from the depths of your heart, entering into a loving dialogue with God the Father, with the Lord Jesus Christ, with God the Holy Spirit. I mean, have you ever even thought about addressing different persons of the Trinity in your own personal prayer? Pretty amazing to consider that God wants to dwell with us. He wants to enter into this conversation with us every single day. One of the primary ways that I do it is spiritual journaling. It's not like a diary, don't get any ideas. Okay, it's currently sitting backstage. I've been working on this current volume for about three months now. I don't think there's too many secrets in there, okay? But I can tell you what there is, is a full exposure of what God's doing in my soul at any given moment. It's me writing down everything that I would be saying to God if I was just saying it in my head. But now I'm writing it down because it helps me stay focused. And then I'll often I'll pause and I'll listen and I'll put in brackets what I think I hear God saying back to me. Sometimes it is really, really clear, not even necessarily out of the clouds, but in the depths of my heart, I can hear what God is saying in response to whatever it is that I'm bringing to him. It could be personal struggles. It could be family life. It could be work, school, relationships, different strains and, and hurts in my own heart that I'm bringing to the Lord, that I'm surrendering to him, and that I'm then listening in response, allowing God to, to respond to whatever it is that I'm bringing to him, right? Right? Oftentimes what I'm really writing in brackets is scripture, the very word of God. If you have a hard time hearing the voice of God, then the chances are that you are praying in the word of God every day are slim. Because this is how God loves to speak to his people day in and day out. So love the scriptures and memorize the scriptures. But I can tell you that mental prayer, whether it's written down or whether it is spoken aloud or simply in the depths of your heart, is one of the great remedies for mortal sin. In fact, St. Alphonsus de Liguori said that there is literally no chance of mental prayer and mortal sin coexisting. It's impossible. At some point, one of them has to fall. Well, let it be mortal sin <laughs> that falls. So to enter into this mental prayer, this loving dialogue with God every day, you've got to set aside time. And you probably need to find a place. And you need to find a method that works for you. Spiritual journaling works really well for me. What I want to introduce to you all this afternoon is what Steubenville calls the PAL method. P-A-L. I'm not a huge fan of acronyms. It's not my thing. Okay. But the P stands for praise. To first and foremost, as we enter into prayer, to open with the sign of the cross. Maybe you're kneeling by your bedside. Maybe you're finding a chapel within your community and neighborhood. Maybe you go to a Catholic school and you can pop in before school starts. When you first enter into prayer, make the sign of the cross and just begin praising God. As Maury said, to, to thank him 
for all the good and beautiful things that he's doing in your life right now. To call to mind all of the, the great gifts that he's bestowed on you. The gift of life, the breath in your lungs, a roof over your head. I hope three meals a day. Various opportunities and relationships at school. And again, within your own communities as well. To thank God, to begin with prayers of thanksgiving and praise. And what's the difference there? When we thank God, we're saying thank you for what you've done for me. But when we praise him, we're simply giving him glory for who he is. God Almighty. To come to him with a heart full of adoration and praise. So begin there. That's the P of pow. The A is to ask. To ask God. To petition him. To even petition him on behalf of others, which we call intercession. Maybe there are very real needs on your heart at any given moment. There certainly are in my life. I'm always asking God for a greater spirit of vulnerability and courage. Sometimes I really struggle being bold working on a high school campus where everybody, especially by the junior year, is a little bit taller than me. All boys. Everybody's puffing out the chest. There's a lot of testosterone going around. There's also just a lot of bad smells. We have to keep the air conditioning up at a certain level at all times just to deal with the BO everywhere. Guys, am I right? It gets pretty bad. Trust me, if we don't leave the AC going, it's bad. But there's something a little intimidating, right, about work, about school, about certain friendships. Sometimes it's even just kind of intimidating being up here. So I've got to ask God for boldness and for vulnerability to not be up here pretending like I have it all together because I don't. I'm a big mess. There's a reason I go to confession about once every 10 days. That's my current average because I'm a big sinner in need of God's mercy. That's a prayer I was petitioning God for just this morning. Boldness and vulnerability. But also we can do this on behalf of others. I have a very dear friend back home in Nashville right now. Back home in Nashville. Back where I used to live in that town called Nashville. Uh, her name is Rosie. She's 19 years old and she's dealing with cancer in a way that's been really, really tough. She beat it the first time around, but now it's back. And the doctors are not so confident that continued chemotherapy and radiation is going to work. And so right now her family is banding together to go to Lourdes, France to seek a miracle. And that trip is scheduled for two weeks from today with a great priest friend of mine from Chicago. And I know I'm one of a few thousand people right now praying for a miraculous cure for Rosie. I believe that God listens to those kinds of bold and specific prayers. About 10 years ago, I knew a young man in high school back in Nashville who was diagnosed with stage 4 Ewing sarcoma cancer. The doctors gave him very little chance to live, but over the course of 8 to 10 months, he went through aggressive chemotherapy and radiation. At this point that I know of, over 5,000 people across the country began praying for this young man, specifically through the intercession of Pier Giorgio Frassati. Well, I happened to be in Turin, Italy, in the midst of this, when it really was getting bad. When it didn't look like there was a lot of hope, suddenly they had gone through all the chemotherapy and all the radiation, but the doctors found this massive, massive spot that they knew was cancerous. And so they had a scan on a Friday. They opened him up for surgery on a Monday. Me and three other guys, two of whom are priests now, one of whom is a seminarian studying in Rome, were at the bedside where Pier Giorgio Frassati died as a 24-year-old young man. And we leave behind Marshall's prayer card. And we pray for that miracle. And no joke, on Monday morning when those doctors opened up Marshall, they could not find the spot. They couldn't find it. He's now 10 years in remission and nobody can explain why. He's a walking miracle. Do you think that that was just a, a mistake or some kind of accident? I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God loves it when we come to him with these bold and specific intentions. So be not afraid to ask big in prayer. So again, pal, P-A-L, praise, thanksgiving, that's step one. To ask God, to petition on your own behalf or to intercede on behalf of others. And then finally, as somebody put over here, the L stands for listen. We've got to get in the habit of listening. If you're anything like me, your head and your heart 
are full of a lot of noise, and most of it can be traced back to this bad boy. I've been addicted to my phone at times. Did you know that right now the average American scrolls the height to Mount Everest and back every single year with their thumb? That's a lot of time wasted. That's a, a culture of noise and distraction that you and I are being raised up in, that we're having to contend with every single day. It's hard to listen. It's hard to focus in. It's sometimes hard to even just listen in a conversation with a friend. I get so easily distracted. And a lot of it, in my case, is selfishness. I begin thinking about myself. I begin thinking about the next thing going on in my schedule that day. I begin thinking about some long-term project that I'm working towards. I begin thinking about everything other than the presence of God before me in prayer, but also in conversation with others. We've got to learn how to listen. We've got to learn how to push back against all of that noise and all of that chaos and all of that distraction. And maybe, okay, you, you got the little bit of the ADHD thing going. That's fine. If you find yourself wandering, just keep coming back. St. Francis de Sales says there's no more powerful prayer than to keep coming back to Jesus over and over and over again, even if it's once every 25 seconds because you're finding yourself distracted once every 25 seconds. As soon as you realize you're distracted, just come back. Don't lose your peace, just come right back and surrender that distraction to the Lord. Actually, you could also pull a little trick on the devil here who wants to keep you distracted. You could begin talking to the Lord about the distraction. Because guess what that is? Prayer. Maybe actually you find yourself at, at times really, really tempted in prayer. Well, fall to your knees. Start saying the name of Jesus out loud over and over and over again. Trust me, the harder the devil pushes on you, the more he tempts you, especially away from prayer or distraction while in prayer, and then the more you go even deeper in, the more he'll eventually give up. You'll be like Padre Pio. The devil literally stopped tempting him at a certain point. He gave up on him, and he just started lighting his bed on fire at night. Okay? That's a good sign. If you're waking up and your sheets are on fire and there's no logical explanation, that means you are probably becoming a saint. The devil has given up on you, and he just wants to be done with you, right? So we've got to be bold. We've got to praise God every single day. We've got to ask him to be everything that he wants to be in our lives, to intercede on behalf of others, and then to really deeply listen, to ask God for that, that posture of what's called recollection, to be recollected, to be constantly aware of the movements of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to end on a practical note, and then we're going to take all of your questions. There's some really beautiful questions that have been coming in all in the last hour. But the last point is this. It's not enough to just walk away from Steubenville, Florida, saying, I want to pray more. I mean, that's a nice-sounding resolution, but that's actually a bull crap resolution. Right? We've got to be specific, right? We've got to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to commit every morning 15 minutes of my time to you. I'm going to open up the scriptures. I'm going to pray a decade of the rosary. I'm going to do a divine mercy chaplet. I'm going to take this PAL method seriously. I'm going to buy a journal, and I'm going to begin writing out my personal conversation with you every single day for 15 minutes. And then, you know, what you should do is at night, the same kind of thing. Because at night, you can powerfully reflect back on the day on how God has been moving in your midst, how he has blessed you, how he's given you graces, but also how you have failed him, how you have sinned how you have failed to love others. And then guess what? You can repent. And you will feel so much better as you lay your head down at night, having repented of your sins and entrusting yourself to God's mercy. These are very simple and powerful things we can do that will transform our lives, that will give us peace beyond all understanding, that will give us that joyful confidence in the Lord, in our identity as sons and daughters. And you will become mysteries to the people around you. They'll see it in your eyes. It, it'll be the way you look at people, the way that you talk, the way that you ask questions, the way that you listen. You'll leave a blazing trail of light behind you everywhere you go, not because you took a microphone on stage at a Sumerville conference, but because you were so intimately connected to the vine who is Jesus Christ that anybody who encountered you would encounter him. That's the goal of prayer to be transformed, to be restored, and to ultimately become the very presence of Christ 
in the world. In case you haven't noticed, the world is sick and dying. It's pretty dark. It's pretty despairing. And I'm convinced it's because there aren't enough mystics and saints living among us. What does it mean to be a mystic? To enter into an intimate, loving dialogue with God himself every single day. It begins with 15 minutes. It expands to 30 minutes. It eventually incorporates things like daily mass, a full daily rosary, a weekly holy hour, a daily holy hour. Go crazy. But the Lord awaits us every single day in the intimacy of our heart. It's a beautiful gift that we have as baptized Christians that God dares to dwell not only among us but within us. So let's close in a prayer. We'll invite up a couple of our speakers. I believe Mari and Father Jonathan. And we're going to take some of your questions, but I just want to really ask the Holy Spirit to be with us, to help us pick the right questions and to answer them in a way that will be hopefully very emboldening and empowering for all of us to walk out of here and be more committed to prayer than ever before. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, we thank you for the great gift of prayer. We never want to take it for granted. We ask that your spirit would come upon us now to open our hearts and our minds to all these remaining graces that you want to give us in this workshop. First and foremost, give us a desire for prayer and then a commitment, a tangible, radical commitment to prayer, even if it is simply 15 minutes a day that we build upon. Blessed Mother Mary, we know you are the great mystic, the great saint, the great mother of the church. Through your prayers, may the Holy Spirit constantly teach us how to pray. May that same Holy Spirit groan within us that we might forever cry out, Abba, Father, and rejoice in our identity as sons and daughters. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've got about 20 minutes to take some very cool questions that you guys have begun submitting in about an hour ago. And I'm going to actually take the first one uh, and hand it right to Father Jonathan because clearly the man prays, right? See, he's a priest. That's a supernatural vocation. Okay, the natural call, if you want to call it that, is to marriage and family life. But you've got to listen deeply to hear God call you to something as wild and radical as the priesthood. So, Father Jonathan, this yes. is really cool and it's perfect question to ask you. What makes the Holy Mass so powerful and why is it a good foundation leading towards a vibrant prayer life? Two questions there. First answer, Jesus. Second answer, because he said so. Care to expand? <laughs> what makes a Mass so powerful? Um, the calling forth of the Holy Spirit as we hear the Word of God as we allow that word of God to begin to take root in our own lives, prepares us to be able to receive our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. Um, both of those help build the foundation of that relationship, the relationship with the Lord, of the Lord speaking to us and us listening to him. And then as we offer ourselves and give our hearts back to the Lord, there's this change of re exchange of relationship that happens within the context of the Mass. And the fact that we're not doing it individually, it's not just me and Jesus and like the heck with the rest of the world, but that we do it together as a community, as a body of Christ, that it strengthens the body of Christ. Beautiful, beautiful. Mari, why does it feel like God doesn't answer when I talk with him, like a real conversation? When I pray, I try and I just talk with him, but I feel like I don't hear anything back, almost like my prayers aren't being heard. Have I done something wrong? That's a good one. That's a good one. Um, long story short, God does answer. The way that he answers is going to be different, right? And so I always say obvious ways that he answers that sometimes we ignore, like the whole Bible <laughs> is Jesus speaking to us, right? And I can't tell you how many times I've opened the Bible and I'm like, wow this is wild, right? Like, this is exactly what I need to hear, and this is, like, the Lord piercing through my heart. Um, he's also spoken through really weird ways. Like, even, like, the, you know those dove chocolates? You know how they have those messages? Like, there's been time that I opened that, and I'm like, that's straight Jesus. Like, thank you, <laughs> Lord, you know? Like, like, so he does answer, but it can be through things like that. It can be through other people. 
times where I'm feeling something and a friend will randomly say like, hey, Maddie, you're super random, but I feel like I'm supposed to tell you this. And I'm like, what, Jesus. Um, but the greatest way, and this is where it like takes practice, in the scriptures it says like, to, like he speaks in a quiet whisper. He does speak, but the same way of like, you know when you have a friend and you guys are really tight and you can have a whole conversation but no one's saying anything and you're just like looking at each other and you get it, you know? It's kind of like that, like getting so tight with Jesus that like you can hear exactly what he's saying, even if it's in this like quiet, weird way, but like you know his heart so much and he knows yours. He's speaking and the more you get closer to him, the more audible his voice gets and the more your desires are in tune with his desires. And it's just really cool. And also like through nature, I mean, Jesus, just look around you, honestly, like God's side, he, the whole earth and the whole world has been created to draw us to himself. And if we see all of these things as prayer, then we know he's always speaking. So good. Does writing down what you would want to say instead of saying it out loud count as a prayer? Yes, yes, and more yes. I'm gonna take another question because that one's quick and easy. How do we hear God speak to us in prayer? It's easy to speak to him, but it's so hard to hear him. I want to go with some rules of discernment by Ignatius of Loyola. Has anybody heard of St. Ignatius of Loyola? Anybody? Founder of the Jesuits. By the way, I work at a school called Jesuit High School. Shout out to the boys in the, in the front row. They were very upset with me last night when I didn't give them a shout out, so here we are. They're not even all here right now. What are they doing? I mean, come on. Exactly. They missed the shout out. That's what happens. So how do we pray? How do we listen? How do we know that we're hearing the voice of God? If I had to sum up what, what Ignatius of Loyola called the rules for discernment or even the spiritual exercises, there's three major things. The first is sometimes God just speaks in an extraordinary way. One of my best friends who's a priest out in the Pacific Northwest said that when he was 16 years old, he came out of a confessional, probably the best and real solid confession, first solid confession he had really given in his young life, probably since like he was a kid. He said, when I came out of that confessional in the state of grace, he said, I just heard a voice deep in my heart that said, you're going to be a priest. And I knew that I didn't have to listen to that voice. I knew that I didn't even have to, to follow that voice, but I knew that it was God and I knew that it was his will. And it took him about six years to work through that, but eventually he went to seminary and he's now this on fire, very manly, very cool Catholic priest began in a very tangible way coming out of the confessional. The second way, which is probably the most ordinary, is consolation versus desolation. So consolation is peace and joy that you experience deep in your soul whenever you're bringing things to God in prayer. That's a good sign that God is either calling you or blessing you in some way. So if you feel really, really, really joyful, okay, when you stop and you pray and you think about becoming a great saint, it's because God is calling you to become a great saint, all right? If you feel a tremendous amount of desolation, what you might call fear or anxiety in some area of your life, then that's always a sign of the evil spirit, of the enemy of our soul, right? And you can ignore desolation or any thoughts that you might have in the midst of anxiety and fear and wait for the next season or the next moment of consolation to come. Does that make sense? I really recommend a book by Father Timothy Gallagher called discernment of spirits, if you really want to dive into that. The third, and I think the most helpful, but kind of morbid, is to imagine yourself on your deathbed. This is a great way to learn how to listen to the voice of God in your soul. Imagine yourself on your deathbed looking back on your life. What do you want to see? I mean, we'll say the rocking chair years. Maybe that's a little easier than to think about your deathbed, right? Imagine yourself, 85, rocking on the front porch with your sweet tea. Looking back at your life and maybe a decision you're trying to make right now, what would you want to have seen? And sometimes that snaps us into really incredible decisions that might have been very hard to come across otherwise. The pandemic was sort of like that option three for many, many people. It brought everything to the surface very, very fast and we could see things pretty clearly because suddenly we weren't so distracted, we weren't so busy. I really do recommend Ignatius of Loyola, Rules for Discernment, and also the spiritual exercises, especially for those of you who struggle to hear the voice of God in your own prayer life. Oh, I'm so long. Can I ago. offer Sorry. another perspective on all of that, if I may? Um, sometimes is God speaks to us very consistently. 
Okay, he's not going to ask you to do one thing one day and the next day it's going to be something the exact opposite. So when there's that consistency, we can begin to trust it. It's the voice of God. If, however, it's actually something that's congruent with God's plan. So if, he's, if you hear something and you think it's the voice of God and it's like going against the Ten Commandments, guess what? That's not the voice of God. Okay? And that actually leads to a third way of looking at it is what type of fruit would come forth? St. Paul talks in Galatians 5.22, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Are those coming forth from what's being spoken to you, or is it leading you to the opposite? Um, and again, those are different ways that we can begin to recognize the voice of God speaking to us. And then when we believe it's the voice of God, the importance to be able to respond to it. We don't want to ignore it. Thank you, Father. Beautiful. Another one for you, Father Jonathan. Okay, so I get sleepy whenever I enter into prayer. Mari can relate to that. Is, did you put this one in by chance? No, all right. How can you combat tiredness in prayer? I mean, the word combat makes me think you definitely put this one in. Did you submit this question? All right. How do you deal with tiredness, exhaustion? Okay, so if I'm going to pray and I'm going to already be down like this, good night, Jesus. That's about the only prayer you can make there. Um, but in all honesty, someone once shared with me that men, when they sit down, their brains shut off. Okay, women, you can probably verify that, right? Guys, we can verify it as well, because, like, what do we do? Uh, so sometimes, at least for myself, I'll go for a walk uh, and recognize God's blessings in creation. Um, sometimes I'll go for a walk and start singing. I'll do things more than just being silent. Sometimes it's praying Maybe I'm sitting, maybe I'm kneeling, um, but I'll actually pray out loud. So I'm engaging my senses more than just kind of being quiet and pretending like I'm holy. <laughs> okay. uh, things that actually help me kind of interact. Uh, sometimes it's like, okay, let's go for a run first and get some oxygen back into my veins before I go to pray because I know if I'm already tired. And the last thing is don't pray only at the end of the day. Make prayer a priority at the very beginning. Carve out 15 minutes before breakfast or before you get on the bus to school or go to school or go to work. Make the Lord a priority at the beginning. If you wait to the end, so often we end up giving God the leftover scraps, which is exhaustion. Uh, let's give him the first fruits. I want to majorly echo that. We've got to pray in the morning. I mean, or middle of the night. A lot of great saints pray in the middle of the night, but I hate 3 a.m., you know? We've got to pray in the morning. So My first prayer of the... like half asleep like me, <laughs> then wait till you're awake and then pray, because I would totally... Yeah, my first prayer of the day, after I turn off the alarm, if I have to turn off the alarm, it's like, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will rejoice. And sometimes it's like, <sighs> I will rejoice and be glad in it. <laughs> And that's just, that's the honest truth. That's the first prayer of the day. And then we get going and we get up out of bed and we make the bed and we start the day with the Lord. I'm going to be honest. Sometimes I'm just not in the mood to pray. Do you have any tips on that, Mari? Me too. <laughs> no, seriously, I, especially I went through a phase when I was getting my master's and it was like I was teaching about Jesus all day and then I was learning about Jesus after school and then I was speaking about Jesus on the weekends and like, all that made me think that I was praying, but I wasn't. And it brought me into like a rut. Um, and something that's like super helpful is number one, uh, prayer isn't about feelings. And so there are moments that like, you don't feel like you wanna pray, or there are moments that you don't feel like you, Jesus having this like epic moment, right? It's very easy when you're like, I love Jesus. And we're in a Steubenville conference and everyone's like, ah, right? Like that's super easy. But when you're home and when it's hard, but love is a choice, and, and we have to choose to love God uh, on a daily basis. And so in the same way that you're not going to ignore your mom or dad because you're just like, sorry, I just don't want to be your daughter today. Like, I just, peace out. Like, in that same way, you have to choose to make time for God because he is number one and because he's important to you. And so that's always been helpful for me. And, and knowing that, like, when my prayer life is not on track— like everything just, and I'm like, sorry, Jesus, my bad. I'm into that. Love you. I mean, it's back to the gospel passage. If we seek God first, everything else falls into place. 
Yeah, and sometimes we need to acknowledge maybe we've put the obstacle that's making it difficult for us to listen to God or to pray, and that's when we need to get our tail back to confession and allow Jesus to remove that obstacle, especially mortal sin, so that we can listen to the Lord easier. Yeah, that's huge, because sometimes I'm hiding, because I'm scared of what Jesus is going to tell me. And I don't want him to, I don't want to listen. So th don't do that. He'll find you. <laughs> Some people are resonating. That's good. That's good. Okay, next question. When should you pray a vocal prayer like the rosary versus an intentional personal prayer or mental prayer? That's a great question. I recommend both every day. All right. Uh, there's a bunch of students that back when a sophomore on our campus was struck by lightning, it was Labor Day actually, they began an after school rosary. And initially it was just to pray for the healing and recovery of this young man. And months later, I think 100% by the grace of God and many, many people's prayers, he recovered. He, he's back on campus. He's making a comeback. I mean, when does that happen? When you're struck by lightning, right? That you even come back to life, much less come back to normal. So I really believe in the power of the rosary and other vocal prayers that the church has been praying for hundreds or even thousands of years but build those into your daily life, particularly when it's hard to enter into mental prayer. So for me, I drive 35 minutes to work every day. I pray a rosary. There's not much other kinds of prayer that I can do at that hour. When it's 3.30 and I'm exhausted at the end of a school day, and this group of 10, 15, sometimes as many as 70 students are gathering for what we now have as a tradition in the after-school walking rosary, there's pretty much no other kind of prayer that I could enter into because I'm just so tired. So I think vocal prayer is powerful. Build it into different moments of your day that just become habitual, you know. But when you know that you're at your best, and for me that's the morning. For some of you it might be the night before you go to bed. That's where you ought to do the, the mental prayer, the spiritual journaling, the entering into the, the depths of your soul, what sometimes is called the sanctuary of your soul where God dares to dwell. Those are times where perhaps you're going to be a little bit in a better place to really pray deeply and personally and from the heart. Okay, so the answer is both. Depends on the time of the day and probably the day of the week. Okay, this is a good one, Father, and we've only got time for maybe this last question here. A lot of us really have this mindset. I certainly do at times. And maybe this comes back to things you've already said. But in what way am I to receive answers or signs whenever I pray to God for help? I want to say that God answers every prayer. Yes, no, and not yet. The problem is, is most of the time when we're asking things from God, we want him to answer it the way that we want it answered. And so we're not actually asking God. More times than not, we're kind of telling God what we want God to do for us. And so we end up getting frustrated more times than not when... God, in his goodness, realizes that this isn't going to be good for you. Your desires are wrong or skewed. You know, well, God, help me to get an A on this test. But I didn't spend any time studying. In fact, last night I was out partying with my friends. Probably not going to answer that question or that prayer. Because so, um, God's not the divine vending machine. But isn't that how so often we ask of God? Um, you mentioned something earlier in your talk, uh, petitions and intercessions. And I'm a big fan of both. The way I would describe them is petitions, we kind of take our petition, this thing we want to ask God to do, and we throw it up and we hope like heaven it sticks. Uh, but intercessions, we take the petition, we present before the Lord and ask, how do you want me to pray for this situation? And we begin to listen to what God wants to do. And then as we hear him, then we turn around and pray that way. Uh, so a quick example would be like, okay, I have an uncle that has cancer. Lord, how do you want me to pray for m my uncle Bob? Is it, you know, do you want to heal him? Or is there something else you want to do? Um, and as I was praying, it's like, heard, it's like, no, I want to actually restore the relationships in the family. So then that's how I'm going to pray. It's like, Lord, that your grace would be upon his siblings and his children before he dies. And to be able to see that happen was incredibly powerful. Closing thought, when Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, 
Several of his disciples, not Peter, James, and John, they were trying to cast out some demons in his name and it wasn't working. Does anybody remember what Jesus said to those disciples who seemed very unsuccessful in their deliverance and exorcisms of demons? He said that some demons can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. So don't be afraid of fasting, coupling your prayer life with fasting. And for some of us, that might mean just one day a week where we cut out on a couple of meals and we just have one good dinner or something. Uh, it, it might be that you have some like, health concerns that doesn't make that possible. Well, maybe find some really cool ways to do some intermittent fasting even every day. Like you could be a vegetarian between lunch and dinner every single day, right? That's a joke. That'd be a very easy way to be a vegetarian. It'd be impossible for me, all right? But look for these concrete ways that we can pray every single day. Find a corner in your bedroom and set it aside for prayer. I've got like a little kneeler. I've got some sacred images. If I didn't have that in my bedroom, I wouldn't pray when I wake up and I wouldn't pray before I go to bed at night. Find a chapel. Once a week at least find a chapel and just enter into a deeper, longer, more intimate conversation with God. Final thought, again, from Pope Benedict XVI. There is nothing more important than developing your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, the only way that this happens is in prayer. God bless you guys.